This is Farmland. Coming up, we have a special interview with former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern, who contends that the game is not lost for Irish farmers on Brexit, as he believes a no-deal outcome is unlikely. And while the beer and whisky market booms worldwide, Bobby Miller, the chairman of the Irish Grain Growers Group, says that Irish malt and barley growers need premium recognition for their product. But first, Conor Finnerty visited the farm of one malt and barley grower in Kildare this week to reflect on this year's harvest. James Kelly is a tillage farmer from Matai in County Kildare. His family have been growing malt and barley for generations. At one stage, the Kellys were growing well over 500 acres of malt and barley, but only 40 acres were planted this year. The challenges on a yearly basis growing malt and barley would be uh, to meet the uh, specification levels that are required by the brewing, the selling and malting industries. The biggest challenge of all would be the price we're receiving for malt and barley at present. The premium we're getting over feed barley is totally inadequate and doesn't reflect the quality of the produce that we're producing, which is a premium product. We're simply not getting a premium um, over the price of feed that is sufficient. Kelly pointed out that high straw prices are barely making up for the drop in yields caused by difficult weather conditions this year. The drought conditions has affected all crops this year, but uh, malting barley in particular, especially in um, areas of the country like South Wexford, it has been way back on last year, yes. The tillage farmer fears for the sector moving forward. Well, we feel that we're being driven out of production of malting barley at present and that what we produce is being replaced by imports and that is totally unacceptable given that a product like Guinness, which is uh, synonymous with Brand Ireland, its uh, base raw material is Irish malting barley. It's a product with a unique provenance and uh, it's something that can't be got anywhere else. You have to ask the question, would a company like Diageo be happy to be brewing Guinness based on barley imported? Perhaps the traceability could be questioned. Origin Green has to come into this as well. Are Borbia happy to stand behind a product or a company producing malt whose uh, origin is not Irish? The quality, traceability, and uh, so on and so forth of the product being imported um, has to be questioned to say the least. Bobby, thanks very much for joining us. Can we start off by uh, you just outlining what the Irish Grain Growers Group is about and who you represent? The Irish Grain Growers Group was formed to represent tillage farmers in this country. Uh, we feel we're being underrepresented in, in Ireland the last several years. We morphed from the Irish Mod Group, which met initially in 2014, because malting prices were 147 euro a ton, and we feel we were just being totally underrepresented. Currently, we have approximately 400 members uh, in the, based in the Midlands and Southeast, and we have visions of growing into areas in the Northeast and South, like Cork, and even up to Donegal. We've been in contact with people up there, so. We're donors and upper sweater group. And Bobby, what are some of the concerns among your members at the moment? The biggest concern obviously is the weather this year. Um, it has, there's now only a fodder crisis happening. There's a tillage crisis happening. Yields are well back. Uh, in many in instances, spring crops are yielding, spring barley crops and wheat crops are yielding yet less than two a ton to the acre. Um, of a normal year over the last three to four years, three ton plus was the normal yield so we're well back in yield uh, well back in yield and straw uh, it's just uh, a very worrying time for the tillage sector that's the main concern at the minute straw and grain prices have increased uh, significantly in recent months mm -hmm. but as you said the yields are dramatically back yeah. has the increase in prices alleviated some of the concerns over yield loss uh, it doesn't come towards the bottom line at the end of the day. We're still looking at uh, last making, uh, another lo last making year. Um, straw prices have been driven by other sectors uh, up. It wasn't the tillage farmer I was asking a certain price for the grain, but he was offered more by other sectors uh, to buy this, this straw. Uh, that's where, the, where straw prices drove up. Um, 
we are probably back two thirds uh, number of bales to the acre, uh, and straw prices probably doubled from last year. And that's the situation. So do the maths yourself. It's not we're not being compensated uh, compared to yield loss uh, uh, across the board. So um, it it was a help, but not not a solution. And. Bobby, can you go through the specification process that malting barley growers have to endure in order to get their their malting barley through the to get the pass in the in the merchants? Well, the first thing I'd like to say on it is the specifications have been tightened over the last several years. Um, you today, on the normal year, this year has been an exception. To be fair, uh, on the normal year, we need to produce malting barley at protein levels under ten point eight percent for the, the brewing industry and under 9.3% for the distillate industry. Now, they are very tight specifications to reach and we're not being compensated enough for that tight specifications. Chagas have done trials on this. Uh, even if you target the target distilling uh, standards, you need to um, increase and decrease your fertilizer use. And at that, you probably only get less than 50% of your distilling grade barley passed. And that either goes for brewing grade or feed grade uh, after that. Uh, in a normal year, a, a, about a third of the grain is rejected because it doesn't meet the standards. And in exceptional years, 50%, uh, 60%, and some farmers may get none of their barley passed. So that has to be taken into, into account. And to be fair, the merchants did increase the specification this year from 10.8% up to 12%. Um, what was, did that help? It was a help. It was a help. We requested that, the grain growers requested that, that they increase it up to 12%. It was a help for this year, but it just shows that why can't it malt barley every year with the, 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 that specification? They have just tightened the specifications so tight, it's becoming unworkable. Bobby, can you outline what happens when the malt and barley doesn't meet the grade, when you don't make the specifications? What happens then? Well, what you have to do is you deliver in a load of barley, it gets tested. Uh, there's about 20 specific tests that has to pass, uh, like skin grain issues, uh, fusarium in the grain. There's different, several different tests that has to be done. But if it fails, you have the best, you have the bring it home or try and get another buyer for the, that grain. Uh, that's the simple reality of it. it it's not taken by the by buyers of malt. Are there extra costs involved in that? So if you if you bring mm. your malt and barley and to get it tested um, at one merchant's and then you have to transport mm. it somewhere else to get it and um, to, to, to sell it onto a feed merchant, do you know what are the kind of costs, uh, the cost implications there for the malt and barley grower? Um, the transport is the key one and time consuming as well. You you could have to wait three to four hours to get to get your grain in. There could be queues to get your grain in and you have to wait three or four hours and then to find out that your grain has failed and you have the transport issue then of bringing it to another merchant that you, you maybe haven't done business with and with for the likes of inputs and you're at their mercy then as well. So there's a lot of uh, situations involved in, in growing the crop that's they're not highlighted enough. So you say there, with the increased specification, it did help momentarily. Mm. Would you be looking for that to be increased again? Is that something that should happen look, we, on a yearly basis? Yeah. Look, we understand why the brewing industry and the city industry required the grain to recur. It comes down to the, the alcohol that they can produce from specific t grains uh, and protein levels and the germination of the grain. So we understand that, why they're looking for what they're looking for, but there definitely needs to be, the rules need to be loosened if there, this industry is to go forward, or basically pay up for this grain that you're looking for. So what measures do the Irish grain growers propose to alleviate the situation? Well, currently we're calling for uh, a minimum of 250 euro a ton to be paid for, for grain this harvest. Um, that's more about approximately two, 50 euro over the ton of feed grain at present. That's that's just to show confidence for the sector into the future. The reality is, uh, the next two to three weeks is going to decide a lot for the malting industry in this country, for Irish for Irish grain growers. Uh, it, we're coming to the stage now where 
feed, winter barley and winter wheat are going to be sowed in the next two, three, four weeks, or farmers making up their mind whether it's grown or not. And if there isn't a positive response from the industry, uh, I can see farmers are constantly telling me they're walking away from the industry this year. They're just fed up. The reality this year is malt and barley is probably going to make less money per tonne than feed barley this year. Is that which a first? Is diabolical. Yes, it is a first. Uh, traditionally, farmers have been guaranteed 20, 30, 40 euro a tonne over uh, feed prices, and this has just been wife, wiped out, and it's a pure diabolical situation. Um, on my own farm at home, I grow winter crops and I grow, grow malt and barley, and the figures this year I have is 300 plus to euro an acre more from growing feed crops than growing malt and barley. Now, you have to factor, to factor in the weather in that, of course, but that's, that's the sums that I have in my own farm. Uh, the, in, the industry may wake up. And, Bobby, when you see how, how big the, the industry is worldwide and how the, the market for, for whiskey and beer is expanding and booming mm. in the US, in, in Africa, in the Middle East, um, how does that make the, the Irish grain grower feel on the ground? Uh, we're very disappointed. We welcomed the growth of the whisky industry last week. They announced gr double-digit growth in some countries, single-digit growth of eight, nine, ten percent in in in, uh, in some markets. It's a phenomenal growth. Uh, the whisky Irish whisky industry has a very checkered uh, history. Uh, has was once the leading industry uh, worldwide. Uh, historical reasons it came it was practically wiped out and now it's back growing again. We have the, the likes of Guinness owned by a multinational company like Diageo. Uh, we feel there's a disconnect arriving uh, into the into the whole business from the relationship between the farmer and all these industries. Uh, we need our side of the, the production line is not being represented enough. Why we make a very strong case? We don't. We tell it as it is for what we need out of this business to survive. And we, while we, we do welcome the growth, but it's just I, I fear for the future currently, I really do. And that was outlined also in the VT that we saw there um, of James. Um, so would you be concerned in the future that Irish mal malting barley won't be used in Irish products and Irish drinks products that are out there? Mm. That's the harsh reality coming down the road. That the industry has to realise that. Uh, currently, grain is being imported in this country to, to be used in the whisky industry. We have um, whiskies being made with no Irish grain being being used in it. Uh, there's uh, we we believe grain is being imported for the brewing industry at present as well, and vast amounts of it. Uh, what annoys me as well, only yesterday I found out that uh, our fellow growers in, in France got a price last year in 2017 of about 220, 230 euro a tonne for their malt and barley, whereas we got roughly 160, 170. So there's a huge void there from the same company. So questions need to be asked and we're constantly asking them. But they may realise that this industry is going to be on its knees very soon from at the farm gate. Are there people leaving the industry, Bobby? That um, are you aware of people leaving? H how many barley, malt and barley growers are there at the moment? Uh, traditionally, in the middle and southeast area, there are six, seven hundred growers. Uh, as James Kelly pointed out, there they used to grow a vast amount of grain on their farm, malt and barley on the farm. Now they've gone down to forty odd acres. That's been reflected across the country at present. I'm getting constant phone calls from people telling me that's it, we're finished with, with growing malt and barley. If it, it materialises that we get less for malt and barley this year, or, or less than feed barley this year, we are we are walking away. Why would we hold on to a, uh, an industry where we're being not looked after? There's a huge tradition in growing these crops, huge. My father grew it, my grandfather grew it, my great-grandfather grew it. Guinness is around 250 odd years on the, on the back of Irish growing. The best in the world. The best in the world. 
And Bobby, is your group, the Irish Green Growers, engaging with government, engaging with uh, the, the bigger merchants on these issues? Yeah, thankfully, the door has been opened by the government officials. Uh, we've been up with the Joint Directors Committee. We've met uh, different officials, uh, department officials on this, on various subjects as regards, as regards to each farming. Uh, the door has been open. Uh, we are, are educating a lot of people. Uh, we, we, one thing I found personally about this, about the tillage sector is, is the lack of knowledge out there and the lack of investment in the tillage sector that is, isn't even being looked for for the tillage sector. That's one shocking thing I found out in, in my in position. We'll have to leave it there, Bobby. Thank you very much for joining us. And now as the Brexit D-Day approaches, former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern says he takes his hat off to the agricultural industry. We're here with former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern. Bertie, thanks for taking the time. The UK government have published its technical papers on the possible implications of a no-deal Brexit. What's your response to the papers and do you think a no-deal scenario is likely? Well, it's a possible, um, and, uh, but in my view an unlikely possibility. Uh, I think the technical papers are kind of a follow-on to what they did last year when they uh, they put up about their position papers last summer, uh, and I think it's a it's a good and useful and clever way of filling the the summer weeks and and and, and the debate. Um, I think the British government do not want to be accused of not having made preparations if there was no deal. Uh, there was some of that criticism early on. So I think that the papers, you can read them two ways, but I think the, the, the Prime Minister wanted A, to be able to say that they looked at the consequences uh, of no deal, and B, I think she, she wanted to uh, be able to show to the wider audience, and not only our own party, but I think maybe her own party, but a wider audience as well, you know, to, to, to realise what she has now come to realise in the last 12 months, but not maybe before, um, that there, there are huge consequences, um, and ne mainly negative consequences. Mm -hmm. And if you, I only had a, a quick uh, look through um, about 10 of the, the documents, and because there's a hell of a lot of reading in them, but it, it, it does show uh, just the, the, the huge consequences that would all be by and large negative for the British economy. And it's further evidence that those who say um, about all the pluses, uh, all the, the naysayers and the, the hardline Brexiteers, um, that they're, uh, they're, there's no good news for, for, for Britain in this. And I think the, the value of the papers is that argument that um, they, will, they will find a few scraps of good news, but by and large from uh, an English point of view, from a British point of view, um, for an economy point of view, for their trading, for their future relationships, um, for their historic position with the EU, all of the things they're trying to address in these papers that by and large are negative. What about um, in the papers where they address that they recognise that there is a unique relationship between Ireland and the UK, but for businesses in the north that are tra trading across the border, it's suggested that they seek advice from the Irish government. Yeah, well, uh, it, it, it's good that they reckon we have better answers than them. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think um, uh, it's a strange way to try and uh, play, play it off. Um, but I think it's a bit of a kickback to what we've been saying um, in many respects to them. You come up with the solutions. We're not going to. We're not going to give you the uh, the solutions. So I think that's that's what that's about. It's a it's a bit of a play a playback. Um, of course, it's not the answer. But I think uh, you know I, I interpret it as that. Um, you, you've been accusing us, um, or, t or you've been pointing out to us. You have to come up with the solutions. We'll sit here. So I think that's what that's that's about, and I suppose if you take it in that spirit, you know, fair enough, you know. But thankfully, we're 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 you know we, we do have a lot of the answers. I, and in fairness, if it was this time last year or this time two years ago, we'd be all saying our level of preparedness here is not good. Uh, but I, I think across sectors and across industries, because a lot of the good work done, 
you know, by the farming organisations, by the business organisations. Um, we, we, our level of preparedness and uh, our knowledge now is, is really grown in the, in the last 12 months. And I'll get into the farming uh, side of things in a moment, Bertie, but do you think that um, in, in general terms, what do you make of where we're at at the moment, uh, where, where the, the negotiations are at? Did you anticipate that they would be much farther on at this stage? Yeah, I mean, they, they should have been. Um, to take it that, uh, well, I, I suppose, you know, not to go back on, the, on what is a history lesson now, uh, triggering Article 50 um, and you know, setting the date um, without any of the groundwork done uh, to me, always was a very poor decision. Um, you know, th she didn't have to trigger Article 50 at the time that she did. Um, uh, a lot of the, the preparation, a lot of the analysis, uh, a lot of the preparatory discussions, but not negotiations, uh, could have been going on before you, you, you trigger that. Uh, now you come to a position where, you know, three quarters of the negotiating time is gone and there doesn't seem to be uh, much conclusive analysis of, of where we're going and you know that's poor negotiations no matter what way you're saying it, it, it's most polite terms um, it's not certainly the way I would would do things and I'm surprised that the British government who are usually um, you know fairly good hands at, at these kind of negotiations uh, would do but I suppose that's because of the political problems the political uncertainty uh, the level of enmity and animosity that's been built up within the political system over this, uh, the fact that the Tory party are sixers or sevens and the Labour party don't seem to be far behind them. Um, you know, that has led to this position. But anyway, where we are as we go into what is the final session um, is that we, we head to, towards September. Uh, two months really before a deal is meant to be wrapped up to give sufficient time for it to go to the Commission, to the Parliament. Um, I, to be just frank about it, I don't see that happening. I, I do not see them having um, completed discussions at the end of October. Uh, I think the ball, or the can, as it has been described in the UK, it'll be kicked down the road again. Uh, How far down the road? That's hard to say. It, it could be anything from a month to months. Um, I think if you listen to Barnier, he'd say, you know, we must conclude it. But uh, I, I don't. The danger of rushing it, I think you know my view on the date of, of having this midnight grandstand on the last day. I, I, I would be in favour of kicking it down the road at least, you know, towards Christmas. Because. Um, uh, my, my fear, and as I, I've, I've been expressing now for the, 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 you know, all year, uh, is that the European Commission and the Parliament, um, the Barnier C Committee uh, and the British Government find themselves at the end of October and find themselves obliged to conclude a comprehensive deal um, when they've effectively run out of time and they can't conclude it. And then you try, you, you try to... Uh, um, everybody shows their, their last hand on the last few days um, and that you can be bounced into a position, good or bad, but normally in these situations it's bad. So uh, I, I hate those kind of negotiations. It, it, it's, it's, it, it is often what happens. I've been part of them myself. I, I'm not saying that it's, not, it's unique or anything like that. But you know, th these are negotiations that have lasting effects for a long time across all sectors. Uh, massively important for us, massively important for agriculture, massively important for every aspect of the economy. So I think bouncing yourself in uh, to a, a deadline that shouldn't have been a deadline that was set in the first place um, just uh, compounds a bad decision um, by back to what I said about triggering Article 50 when it wasn't necessary to do so and there was no compulsion to do at that time. Um, so there will be an extension. I'm very certain there'll be an extension. Everyone's saying at the moment, but there won't. So I'm going against the tide. But but I think there will. It might be short, but it, that'll be better than, than than trying to conclude it by Halloween. And do you think the EU would go for that extension? That they would? Yeah, they... yeah, yeah. I think they'd be silly not to. I I I, I think they they keep on saying, by the way, for the next six weeks there's no extension. But I think when the reality. Um, how, how they can conclude 
a deal uh, is detailed and is comprehensive uh, and is argumentative and is politically difficult um, within a period of effectively two months uh, is beyond me. And, you know, I'd rather see... Um, it, it's not a question of, of no deal long term. We're only talking about no deal for, for an, an interim period that allows the negotiations to continue and maybe in a, in a, in a, calmer, a calmer way. Like, like, if you look at it, the reason the October deadline is there is because the March deadline is there because of the, the uh, they've already moved the March deadline effectively by having the transitional period, which means in the transitional period that the single market rules and the customs union rules and effectively how we live at the moment in the European Union will continue for, a, a, well, a two-year period. Um, so the, the reason... Um, you know, to spend a bit more time doing it uh, is, 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 is I, think, I think, really something that I can't see any argument against. Do you think the transitional period would also be extended? Um, they, they probably won't say that yet, but if, if I was Theresa May and with her political difficulties, um, uh, now Barney, I think, might be far tougher on this, but you, you would be trying to, to kick the can to the other side of the, the British election um, and, and let this be argued around. Like, what I would like to see is that the referendum for this, rather than people talking about a second referendum, uh, which I don't really see, I, I think you know, people have given their view two years ago now, so I can't see them going back and having that referendum again, but the, the British general election could be the, the referendum, uh, and that would be a far clearer one. Like, what are, what are we now, we are two years, we'll be two years out from British general election. So let the transition period get to the other side of that and let the British general election and let the debate in the next British general election be about the issues that should have been debated in the last referendum. Uh, whether the United Kingdom want to break uh, 50 years of, 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 you know, partnership with the European Union. And I think... Uh, that would be a far better political debate, and um, you know, I, I, I'd love to tell you that I'm very impressed with the Labour Party's policies. But anyway, there is confusion as the Tories at the moment, and that's the reality. What about the backstop issue? Do you think we will have a, a satisfactory outcome there? Yeah, I, I, I think you know, there's a deal on that of last year. Will it remain exactly as it was put to us last December? Uh, I don't think that's likely. I mean, w w what we want to ensure, and we've moved a long way down that road. Like the free movement of people is kind of now a given. There's not going to be a, a difficulty. Well, there might be a free movement of people outside of the UK, and uh, it w will be a different issue. But I think the relationship with Ireland, as far as travel, as far as movement for us, uh, I don't think we're going to have a problem with that. We're not going to have any of the problems that we thought about people travelling across the border and that. So it's really down to, uh, to goods um, and trade, I, I think. Uh, and if, if um, Theresa May sticks by her checkers white paper, which we have to assume that she's wedded to that to a certain extent, um, then you know that's okay. Like that, that covers you know trade fairly fairly well. It doesn't co cover services because services is big to uh, to to the UK. So, uh, and effectively, what that white paper says when you stop all the nonsense is that the customs union would continue. Um, now the Brexiteers don't want that, but I mean the British government have put a white paper out. The white paper isn't written in stone. We we know that. Um, but I, I think that's workable enough and, and from the border point of view, from a security point of view on the border or you know, creating difficulties in the border, I think that's workable through. I, I, I cannot see, I was in Qu Queen's University yesterday debating these issues and uh, you know, talking to people in Northern Ireland to this and I think the heat has gone out of that issue other than people trying to generate it. So I, 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 I hope that works out okay for us. So whether the backstop is exactly as it was, but once we keep a frictionless border that we can trade and we can trade openly um, north and south and we can trade with the UK, uh, let's hope that's okay. And on agriculture in particular, the implications obviously of Brexit are, are very, very bleak across 
all the sectors, um, particularly for the beef sector, with 50% of our exports destined for the UK. Where will that beef go after Brexit? Well, you know, while we're out there already, and in fairness, the industry is, is doing their, their best to, to see um, where we can do alternative marks. And I must say, you know, I, I, I must say a salute to the agricultural industry and the way they're out there, you know, examining and looking and, um, and preparing themselves probably more than most uh, sectors have done. And I think that's, that's been a very good thing. But in the end of the day, um, the British market, uh, and I've seen this all my political life, is, is massively important to us. Uh, you, you, know, you, 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 cannot, you cannot be dealing with... with, 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 with we, we have to get stuff on shelves quick as possible. Uh, that's how we've built up the industry, you know, for the last half century and longer. And, you know, for us, um, there, there, there is no beating getting, you know, fast time uh, from, from, from our factories, uh, from our uh, farms, um, from our poultry people, uh, from our horticultural industries, as quick as we can, A to B, into the British market. And uh, there's not alternative markets uh, for a high proportion, as good as people are trying to do, um, and, and I think they will, they will pull down the, the percentage. But still, it's a huge market. So how how the um, how that's uh, concluded in the end? But let's be frank about it: uh, the British are massive net importers of good quality food. Um, they have a large population. Um, they don't have other easy markets that are non-European that they can do these silly trade deals they talk about and find stuff in. Yes, they can, they can have their relationships with New Zealand and Australia and they can get certain amount, but they cannot get uh, quality, fresh, uh, durable products that are you know, onto their marketplace. And as we move to an age um, of... of you know, more and more environmentalists when we're, we're, we're moving away from packaging and, and injecting uh, into foodstuffs that will have long lives. That's why I'm a big supporter of that. I think we should be pushing hard and hard to get out of packaging because the more non-packaging, uh, the more the Irish product becomes uh, far, far better. So I think we, we have to do that. But the, the British are conscious of this. I talk to many British politicians and officials and, uh, you know, I, I, I think this game isn't lost by us and, and, and we, we just need to keep up the pressure. We need to keep agriculture on the front page. And I think in, I've seen this yesterday in Northern Ireland, you know, in Northern Ireland, in, in the end of the day, Northern Ireland agriculture is 87% is dependent on the European Union. And uh, it's in their interest to keep rattling the can um, in, in Britain and um, the DUP I have to be continually reminded of that because it's in their in interest that, that, that Northern Ireland farmers, which is really the same arguments for us, uh, that we, we protect our, our, our market share in the UK market. Post-Brexit, if food price drops in the UK, how would Irish beef compete with lower priced qualities meat from other countries? Uh, th th this is going to be... Uh, this is going to be a, a battle, you know, for for market share, um, uh, but you know, I think it'll be another day's battle. But I I, I would say this: um, the UK have to be very very careful where they take their alternative supplies from. Um, I don't want to say anything derogatory about any country's market, but they have to be very. Uh, clear um, that the, the disease uh, preventative programs that the UK were so strong about for the last 40 years are maintained, that the high regulatory environment is maintained, uh, that the quality standards that we have proved beyond all doubt in this country, uh, that if they're going somewhere else they have to be able to show to their market that. And if, if they don't show it to their market, well, um, I, 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 I think there'll be a, a good Irish lobby that will, will highlight the differences. Um, I'm not convinced uh, that it's so easy uh, for British multiples to be able to go elsewhere 
uh, to receive the kind of quality uh, and quantity and standards uh, and regulatory environmental and health standards that people demand nowadays. And um, I, I trust the Irish industry to, to, to be able to, uh, to, to play that game uh, at a high level. You mentioned there about farming in Northern Ireland and that farmers are 87% dependent on uh, supports from the Common Agricultural Policy in the EU. Do you think, how, how much of a priority do you think Northern farmers are to the UK government at the moment? Because it is, it is a very, very vulnerable region. Yeah, I, I, I don't think the British government, and I, I, I'm not saying this tongue-in-cheek, I don't think the British government take too much interest in Northern Ireland, full stop. Um, uh, you know, in my day, there was a, a Northern Ireland department dealing with mainly the political issues, but dealing with all issues, um, in number 10. There's nobody now in number 10 dealing exclusively with Northern Ireland. Nobody. Um, our own government... Uh, the DUP or the dominant party on that side propping up the, the British government. Um, there has been no meeting between the, the Taoiseach or the Irish government and the DUP uh, since the last commemoration in Enniskillen on the 7th or 8th of November. Um, so there's no real interest in number 10 and there's no real interest uh, with the DUP either. And um, that's a sad that's a pity. I, I don't think that should sustain itself for very long. I think the um, I think the institutions are necessary to be in Northern Ireland. Um, and if I, I was, I've, I've been asked. To, can I just give you the logic of, of of this? Like, if the institutions in Northern Ireland were up and running tomorrow, which I'd like to see them. I know they won't be tomorrow, but let's say before Christmas. Like people say, oh, you cannot get the institutions up and running until we see where Brexit goes. I, I stand that on its head. If the institutions were up in Northern Ireland in the next number of weeks, the executive in Northern Ireland would be able to deal with these issues. The assembly in Northern Ireland would be able to deal with these issues. The first minister and deputy first minister would be able to go to Europe, go to Britain and argue these issues. The north-south element would be between the Assembly and our government. They could be dealing with these issues. And the East-West between the Irish government and the British government could be dealing with these issues. And you know what's happening today? There's nobody dealing with these issues. And there's, there's no connection. So the Assembly, the, assemb or the institutions in order and art, all three strand, would be a help to the Brexit debate. And those who say the opposite, I'm afraid, are misleading the people. What about the Irish government's preparedness? Are you confident that they will see the country through this and protect the agricultural sector? Yeah, I've, I've been supportive of the Irish government because I think somebody has held the offices that I've held would be, would be not a team player if I, if I wasn't doing that. So I support the, the Irish government's efforts and I support the, uh, the efforts that they're, they're putting in. But I think there's no day to be lost. I, I, I think... Um, uh, you know, whatever industry, but in, in particularly in agriculture, because you know, I, I know all the stats. We could keep you here all day talking about the stats. You know them as well. That that the Irish farming and the small companies start off in on their export life in one market, in the UK market. Um, and then maybe they grow and maybe then they, they become carry and whatever. But we all start small. So that perishable, important uh, market for all our products uh, is into the UK. So I, I think we every day we have to be you know, fighting the cause of, of, of agriculture. Agriculture, is, agriculture isn't you know, the farmers of Ireland. It, 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 it's, it's a huge part uh, of the economy, of the countryside, of, of the rural communities. Um, I was lucky enough in my political career to to have negotiated the, 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 the agriculture rounds or the financial perspectives. I think I did three or four of them as finance ministers and as teaching over the years. And agriculture always was the big one for us. I always worked with, with, with all of the farm bodies in, in those discussions. And it, 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 it taught me, if I needed it, because my background, my, fa my father was a farm manager, my sister farms, all my relations farm. So, you know, I, I, I knew it instinctively, but I learned it in, in politics and as Minister of Finance and as Taoiseach that, 
you know, this is incredibly important to our economy and incredibly important to our country and it has to get prominence into the negotiations. Bertie, I also just have to ask you about any potential plans or intentions on the presidential election, either now or, or in the future. Well, na na now I think it's, uh, the campaign is off. I'll be a spectator watching it, and, and God knows what is the future. Okay, thank you very much for your time, Bertie. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice talking to you. That's all we have time for this week. A big thanks to our guests and to Homeland, the partners of our show. If you would like to get in touch with the Farmland or Agriland teams with any story ideas or comments, you can call or email us directly or get in touch on our social media channels. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.